Okay, section 1.6, inverse functions. <sighs> f of x has an inverse function, f inverse, this little negative one exponent thing, we say f inverse. If and only if f of x is one to one. So graphically, f of x must pass the horizontal line test in order for f inverse to exist. The horizontal line test, just like the vertical line test, except it's horizontal instead of vertically. So you can see we've drawn this blue line through the graph horizontally. Because it hits more than once, the inverse will not be a function. There's still an inverse, but it's not a function. Because when we remember to get an inverse, you reflect it across the line y equals x. That didn't really go straight through at zero. You reflect it across this line, and that's where this graph down here comes from. It ends up looking like a sideways parabola. Well, just like that blue line hit twice horizontally, this blue line is going to hit twice vertically. So the inverse will not be a function if it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So to fix it, what we do is we only graph half of the original parabola so that when we do the reflecting over the line y equals x, we only get half. And that does pass the vertical line test. So that means we have to restrict the domain. Well, half of a parabola, the middle is the vertex. So if we restrict it at the vertex, we will always be sure to get an inverse function. So for parabolas, x minus h squared plus k, the vertex is always at h comma k. Well, I'm restricting it at the x value, so I'm always going to make it x greater or equal than h, so that I always get the right half of the parabola. You could choose the left half instead, but then there's an extra step that I'm not going to review right now. So let's just stick with the right half. We will always do x is greater or equal than h in order to restrict our domain. That way, when we find the inverse, there's some stuff down at the bottom there. It will always be a function. So there's that stuff at the top again, restricting the domain. It'll always be, again, I'm going to write it what I just wrote y equals x minus h squared plus k, we will always restrict it at x greater or equal than h, opposite the parentheses. So in order to restrict the domain on our example, we need it in graphing form. And right now it's not. So this is a review of completing the square, which you might not have seen too recently. It was definitely taught in two and three. First of all, I'm just gonna make it y because it's easier to write y every time. So y equals 2x squared plus 8x minus 1. First of all, when you're completing the square, we don't want any coefficients on our x squareds. So I'm going to factor the 2 out, and it has to be factored out of both terms that have an x. So divide by 2, and I get 4x. Then I'm going to add this mystery square, close the parentheses, and leave the minus 1 at the end. So what we are going to do is we are going to complete the square on just the part in parentheses. So it's going to be a perfect square. x squared has to be in the corner, x and x. But for it to be a square, this has to match this. And they have to add to be 4x. In order for them to match, they both have to be 2x. So it's plus 2 and plus 2. So I'm going to leave some space over here, bring down the 2. It's x plus 2 times x plus 2, which the easy way to write that is x plus 2 squared. But that square that I'm now going to make red comes from whatever's in this box. When I finish completing the square over here, 2 times 2 is 4. So I'm going to add 4. But because I added a 4 in a parentheses with a 2 on that side, I have to add 2 times 4 on this side. So it's actually, to keep it balanced, y plus 8 equals 2 times x plus 2 squared, and I forgot my minus 1. Then to finish it, you're going to minus the 8 from the constant. So completing the square, this is the same as the equation written over here. But now that it's written that way, I should probably change it back to k, I can restrict the domain as needed. So because it says x plus 2 in parentheses, I'm going to restrict it to all x is greater or equal to negative 2, because it's always opposite. Now that I've restricted it, I can identify the inverse function. Remember, you learned a couple different ways to find the inverse. 
the biggest one in my classes, and I taught like four sections of this last year, five sections of it, is making a list of what's happening right now. Let's make the list in purple. So if we were plugging a number into the parentheses, into x, the first thing we would do is add 2. Then we would square it. Then we would multiply by 2. And lastly, we would minus 9. And then to find the inverse function, you do opposite order, opposite math. So I'm going to go up the list and do the opposite thing. I'm going to add 9 first. Then I'm going to divide by 2. Then I'm going to square root it. And then I'm going to minus 2. So k inverse equals, you always start with x, add 9, divide by 2, square root all of that, and then minus 2 at the end. This would be our inverse function. This is our original function with the domain restriction. Okay, if you remember finding inverses like we just did, then you probably remember what comes next is verifying inverses, proving they are inverses. Remember, in order to algebraically prove or verify that they are inverses, you have to do f of g of x and g of f of x. You have to do both. And do not skip steps. Show everything and obey order of operations. And then remember that sentence you had to write at the end of every proof? Since f of g of x and equals x and g of f of x equals x, they are inverses. So there's a lot of different ways you can write that notation, by the way. So we could say f with the little circle, g of x, or we could do parentheses, f of g of x, or we could do f of g of x in parentheses and then the x afterwards. But this is why it's sometimes called fog and goff, because the little o thing looks like an o. We have to prove that, that equals x and g of f of x, or goff. So some teachers call this fog and goff. I just call it proving inverses. So the first one is very much like what you did last year. So if you remember from last year, one side of the table, you're gonna do f of g of x. The other side of the table, you're gonna do g of f of x. Because this one is a little more straightforward, and you'll see on our next example what I mean by that, the nice thing is, is that when you do f of g of x, it will always match the order of the first letter. So if I look at equation f and I look at the order of operations, if I plug something into equation f, the first thing I would do would be cubing it. Where am I gonna write this? I'm gonna write it over here, cube it. Then I'd multiply by two and then I'd subtract one. When we get there, that's gonna be the order things cross out. So we practice composition of functions in a previous video. This means we're gonna take equation g and we're gonna plug it into equation f. which means I'm gonna start with equation f, two, but instead of an x, I'm gonna write the whole equation g. Then I'm gonna finish it. It was supposed to be cubed minus one. So hopefully you can see I put equation g inside equation f, and now we simplify it. You can look at what's closest together and cancels each other out, or you can look at this list. This is the order they cancel. The cube and the cube root cancel first. And then I write down everything that's left. You can only cancel out one pair, opposite pair of functions at a time. You cannot cross out more than one pair at a time. The next thing is the two, times two divided by two cancels out. And then plus one minus one cancels out. And hopefully you remember from last year, you should always get X at the end. I like to put a little check mark to show me I got it right. And now I have to do it the other way, fog and goff. Now we go backwards. Put equation f into equation g. So I'm going to start with g. g has a pretty big cube root. Instead of an x, I'm going to write equation f. Finish equation g. And see that inside equation f, sorry, inside equation g, I have plugged in equation f. When I go to do this side, the first letter is G, it's going to cancel out the order of G. So the first thing that happens is you add one, you'll notice it's opposite the other order. Divide by two and then cube root. That's the order things are gonna cross out. So first plus one minus one crosses out. Write down everything that's left. 
if you try to take shortcuts, you're going to get one out of these are worth five points. And that's assuming you remember your sentence at the end. One thing crosses out at a time, next is the twos. Mathematically, only one thing can happen at a time. Next is the cube and the cube root. And then you get X and then you write your sentence. My sentence is since F of, I use the parentheses personally, but you can use the of symbol. F of G of X equals X, which is also what F of G of X equals. They are inverses. Okay, this one matches an integrated three level. There was one x in each equation. f of x had a single x in the equation and g of x has a single x in the equation. Let's look at our next example. There's two x's in each equation and they're fractions. There's really only two types that we do this year. It's either gonna be one that we just like the one we just did or it's gonna be like this one. So we're gonna start it the same way but we can't there's no like shortcut way to know what's gonna cross out first. You really just simplify in these, which some people find easier. But let's set up our table. So we're gonna do f of g of x, and we're gonna do g of f of x, one at a time. So this time, wherever you see an x, you have to plug in the other one. So that means if I'm plugging g into f, I will start writing equation f first. 3, but then I see an x, so I'm going to plug in 6x minus 4 over 5x plus 3. The whole g equation gets plugged into that x. Then I keep writing equation f, it says plus 4 divided by 6 minus 5, but then there's another x, so I plug in all of equation g again. Every x becomes whatever equation it is you're plugging in. In this case, we're plugging in f. Now we just start simplifying. Well, yeah, I'm gonna call it simplifying. So what I don't like here is there's fractions in fractions. So to get rid of fractions inside of fractions, you look at the denominators, and in this case, they're both five X plus three, which is how it's gonna happen. So if I wanna get rid of that, I'm gonna multiply everything by five X plus three. I just want it to cancel out. Technically, I'm just multiplying by one because I'm multiplying the top by five X plus three and the bottom by 5x plus 3, which is just multiplying by 1. When I do that, though, you'll see lots of things cross up. So this 5x, this is one term right here, right? There's terms are separated by plus or minus signs. That term has a 5x plus 3 on the top and on the bottom. Those cross out. And now I just distribute the 3. 3 times 6x, 3 times 4. Negative 4, technically. On this side, there's nothing to cross out, so we have to distribute the 4, plus 20x plus 12. So simplify the top. Now we're going to do the same thing on the bottom. On the 6, nothing crosses out, so we need to distribute the 6. And then right here, you need to be extra careful. Well, I guess we're not there yet. The 5x plus 3 cross out on this term, but right here, you have to be extra careful and make sure you distribute negative 5. Now there's no fractions inside fractions. Now we can simplify top and bottom at the same time. So you can do addition subtraction on the top and addition subtraction on the bottom at the same time because they're on different sides of the fractions. So 18x plus 28, 20x is 38x. Negative 12 plus 12 goes away, over. Now simplify the bottom. 30x minus 30x goes away. 18 plus 20 is 38. 38x over 38 crosses out and you get x and we're halfway there. See if you can set up the other side. I'm gonna pause it and I'm just gonna show you my other side set up. You pause it and set up the other side. Okay, f of x inside of g of x. Make sure you put it in both spots. Fractions inside of fractions, I don't like it, so I'm gonna multiply everything by that little tiny denominator. So this gets multiplied by six minus five x. This gets multiplied by six minus five x. Every term gets multiplied by six minus five x. That's the only reason we can do it because we're multiplying by one. We're multiplying top and bottom by the same thing, which just means we're multiplying by one. Okay, the ones that match cross out. So six minus five x crosses out with the six minus five x because one's multiplying, one's dividing. Distribute. 
nothing crosses out and you're distributing a negative, extra careful with those minus signs, minus 24 plus 20x. That's the top. On the bottom, these ones cross out. Distribute the 5. Nothing crosses out. Distribute the 3. Simplify the top, add, subtract on top. Simplify the bottom, add, subtract on the bottom. 38x over 38 is x. Since fog equals x equals Goff, they are inverses. Okay, so number one should have felt familiar from integrated three. It was part of your inverse essential skill. And then we will practice more of both types in class, of course, and I hope you're doing well.